first tactic that we're going to look at in this video, we are going to call the void. Uh, of course, it's known by many other names and in many other contexts. It is a tactic that is well known to confidence men or con artists, as many call them, as well as to drug dealers and doctors, of which, of course, doctors are essentially drug dealers by another name. So this tactic involves identifying or creating a void in essentially someone else's life, as it usually goes, but it doesn't necessarily have to relate to an individual. It could relate to a company, an association of individuals, groups, or perhaps even something in nature. Another way that this is said is see a need, fill a need, like from that movie Robots. And also among business circles, it is known as essentially, um, well, that same idea, actually, see a need, fill a need, right? So the way that this tactic works is, or there's two ways that you can do this, right? And this tactic is useful to anyone. However, the motives are important. And with motives, we can look at different examples today of how someone can use this tactic for good or evil. The first would of course be television. Television is a very well known uh, mechanism which implements the con artist strategy of identifying a void in people's lives and filling it, such as loneliness or the need for money, gratification, uh, and a distraction from uh, all of the things that we believe are um, bad about ourselves, right? So television identifies voids that are there. Of course, a lot of those voids have been created through the mechanized system of uh, essentially mind control, which all comes from this concept of creating a void in order to fill it. But of course, as anyone knows, when you sit around and watch TV, once you leave the um, distracted realm, or in fact, if you get bored with it, you're not exactly satisfied on the uh, in, on the part of whatever void is being filled there. Which, of course, is the same thing with video games. However, another area in life that we can find this example is with the attorneys. Attorneys are part of a mechanized system to create crimes, and they work hand-in-hand -hand together in the funny court system. They fill the void of the, uh, of like, pol abuses, right? Whether it be police brutality, whether it be negligence at a company, being uh, car accidents, all that stuff, right? So they create this void, and then they present themselves as the option to fill it, even though they never actually do anything uh, although they, if they're really good, then they can convince their clients that they're doing it for the client's benefit, but they're really not. They're doing it for the benefit of themselves and their system, their club that they've bought into. So the attorneys are essentially speaking con men, all of them, but they usually revolve around paperwork, right? They're essentially paper forgers. Another example that we can find of the con man tactic of filling the void, of course, in this context, the void never gets fully fixed, as it were, and it's not supposed to, is with doctors and drug dealers. Now, doctors, they have a quote-unquote license, and they write prescriptions, but they are the same thing as a drug dealer. Drug dealers gain control over their victims by creating a withdrawal symptom from whatever the fix is for that uh, puppet, as it were, for their, um, their victim, right? And then they give just enough of whatever the substance is to keep that person going and to retain a leash over them, as it were. Now, doctors do the same thing. They get people hooked on various pharmaceuticals, as we call them today, and they charge far beyond the true value of their services 
And they can do this because people will see them as the only mechanism, the only way to fill that void that has in fact been created by getting that, it's their drug dealers, right? They control people and they extort large amounts of money, more than they're actually worth, right? The doctors and surgeons and all of them, right? It's more than they're worth. And they extort all of this stuff through the control mechanism they establish by filling the void with drugs. They are no different than your typical kind of uh, drug dealer, uh, gang member guy who um, obtains um, willing foot soldiers through, uh, yeah, like CIA operatives and CIA programs and things like that. Now, this tactic could be used in a good way. That would come down to the idea of increasing a person's capability, making allies, right, um, and uh, increasing somebody else's understanding. Doing something that makes somebody else capable, endearing them to you, and thus you benefit equally. That's sort of the altruistic approach. And there's not many examples today of this being used. However, it could be found in the book, One Page Marketing Plan, by uh, I think it's uh, Daryl Huff. I might have that. I might have that wrong, actually. Actually, it's Alan Dibb with One Page Marketing Plan. Daryl Huff is the one who apparently wrote How to Lie with Statistics. So, in the One Page Marketing Plan, by Alan Dibb. The book talks about the essential idea of marketing to somebody by offering them free things that perhaps they didn't solicit or attempting to better facilitate their transaction, right? Uh, having a machine down, for instance, or having some sort of payment option unavailable, bad marketing strategy. That all comes down to people's perception. However, the most important thing in the book about filling the void, but with good intention, comes from the fact that most companies today have burned people a lot. And so there's a void there, but it's not exactly an easy void to fill, because if you are marketing something, you have to understand that you're coming off on the back foot, right? You are dealing with somebody who is going to be inherently distrustful because of all of the bad experiences they've had across the board because dishonesty is something that is propagated in this current society we live in, in this current juridical controlled mechanism today. And that, of course, is so that more voids are created, so that more classic con man tactics can be used to gain control over people, right? It's a slavery system. And in order to free somebody from the slavery system, you actually have to go above and beyond, not just to convince them of your good intentions, but to actually have good intentions. And to develop a loyal customer who is an ally. And in the old Indian proverb of uh, of trade, right? Um, it states that weddings make allies and allies uh, it's something like that, right? Allies make trade or whatnot. So yes, yeah, so it all comes down to relationships and things like that. And in order to actually fill a void somewhere, it requires building a relationship, whereas it's possibly doesn't always require building a relationship, right? If you get good enough at it, you can identify voids in people and actually fill them, not pretend to fill them, of course, in a manner that you don't gain control over it. You know, just like in the Bible where it says, um, uh, give a man officially for a day, but teach a man officially for his life. But I don't really like that saying. It's kind of uh, coming from the perspective that the, the man in the context is uh, an incapable nimwit. Most people, of course, could fish at the time. Likely. Anyway, who knows? Either way, in order for uh, this type of tactic to be used as good, one has to recognize the inherent value, capabilities, and potential in the intended target. And they would also have to look at them as essentially a target, but not with the intention of turning them into a controlled victim.
right? All about powering them. And martial arts is, of course, a, an example of Bruce Lee about filling a void uh, in, um, in security, in feeling secure. Which, of course, then um, those individuals get removed because they, the, the control of slavery structure of today does not like individuals that come along and free people from slavery and bondage. And so they implant things like the belt system, right? The colors on a belt system, hierarchical things where you're never going to be enough and, and uh, you have to pay and get recognition from licensed practitioners and things like that, right? We all know, know all this stuff. And also, of course, that there's constantly going to be a uh, void of fear, which they only want to be, they want to be the only ones that can fill, right? Like nobody can protect you but your attorney type of crap. So it's uh, important to know both sides of this tactic, how it can be used for good and evil, and of course, how the tactic actually functions and works. And that it doesn't necessarily speaking have to be seen as a tactic or a weapon but in all ways, it can be used as a weapon against enemies and foes, of which we have many, many foes today. Now we come to the tactic of the variable. Now this one, as with all of these, likely goes by a different name in different contexts. And it is a very weird tactic. It requires a, essentially betting or something that most people are uncomfortable with, taking a chance. Now there's a lot of different contexts that this is used, and it's not, technically speaking, a singular strategy that has one way to do it. It could be done in many different ways, hence the idea of variable. Now the idea here is to either, to re is to either reduce or increase variables in opposition to an opponent, because in this context we're talking about the use of weapons. For instance, in poker or any sort of card game, it might be beneficial to, say, empower another opponent against somebody who's clearly winning, right? So if you have, say, Monopoly, right? You had four people play Monopoly, and one person is clearly beating everyone else. Then you can team up with somebody who perhaps might be of lesser skill, but together you can take on the main, main one. But you can do this in a way that increases variables. Essentially, you look to not feed the person who is being capable, and you look to instead feed the other ones who, sure, you might lose against them by doing that, but at least you will not be uh, benefiting the main guy who is clearly looks apparently seems like they're going to win and that's of course coming down to the idea of increasing variables in that in that context they're adverse variables right you're increasing the adverse variables for the opponent and player and sure you might lose but they will probably as well and so a lot of people might hide their skill particularly to protect against this tactic specifically so some ways that this is used for evil today is with the idea of planned obsolescence. Now planned obsolescence also relates to the previous one that we looked at, void. But planned obsolescence, it also creates other variables which lead to other consequences. Sort of like the idea of the butterfly effect, you know, where you have one thing that happens and it impacts everybody else all over the place. And so naturally, with traffic patterns, right, if you have traffic that is intentionally designed to be disruptive, to be annoying and painstaking and things like that, then it creates people who are unstable and who will be angry all day and they'll go around to do things and thus you're creating adverse variables. You reduce the adverse variables, of course, by removing components that cause them, you know, cleaning up the roads, making it so that they're, they, they run smoothly, will lead to most people's days for commuting to work, say, uh, to be better. Of course, you could entirely remove that variable completely by making them stay home, such as with the uh, period in uh, 2020. 
that's of course before all of the nonsense with the riot and whatnot. Because that could also be, you know, for that purpose, you know, try to lock people up in their homes so that they get all uh, antsy and then release them out on the streets, right? Either way, though, obsolescence with vehicles leads to vehicles breaking down, which leads to people not doing certain jobs, which leads to people having to pay for repairs and not having money to support their families, which leads to them selling their houses and leads to the people who they sell their houses to jacking up the price to be really high in the market, etc. So you get the idea of how these uh, adverse variables can be created for evil purposes. Now, adverse variables could also be removed for evil purposes, such as if somebody's coming along saying, hey, you know, you have this guy in your community who's stealing everybody's money. The guy in the community could then say, go frame that person for some crime and th th remove that person from the community and thus silence their voice, removing the adverse variable to that person. Now, of course, in the context of the guy going around and telling everyone in the community that people are trying to steal their stuff, that would be a good way to create adverse variables. If it's true, then uh, such things as, say, a mail campaign, where you as a private individual start mailing out letters to various people warning them of the specifics of a particular uh, con scheme in their in their communities, such as uh, I did this with uh, attorneys in Ohio. All of the city attorneys and whatnot, they're all, you know, real estate attorneys, and they're going around stealing people's property under the color of law across the board. That's an organized effort throughout the entire state. So you send around letters to people, and those will, that will increase the likelihood of adverse variables for these pretty nasty individuals, the opponent, as it were. Now, they would look to remove those adverse variables, of course. Now, if a person is trying to remove good or evil adverse variables for themselves, then naturally they would just do the same thing that everyone else does, figure out a way to remove them, discredit them, etc. Figure out a way to eliminate the impact of those adverse variables. So that's what this tactic is all about. It's either about increasing, it's about increasing adverse variables to whoever your opponent might be, and reducing them for yourself. Now with this next tactic, it is sometimes difficult to determine the motive behind it. That's because the tactic is inherently deceptive. This idea of turning something into vapor is about when somebody hits at you, they hit air. That's because they are essentially speaking, going after something that is not real and not tangible. Now, most of the time today, shell corporations are part of an evil structure for this. So that way you can never actually track down individuals who are culpable because when you go through, say, business filings on a company, you will be led down an endless rabbit trail that leaves nowhere because it's just a series of various shell corporations with possibly even speaking fake names listed out on the documents. There's no way really to know. So it makes it incredibly difficult to hold anyone accountable because if you do in fact find one of the people in the individual organizations, well, they'll just point to the next organization and so on. That is the idea of vapor. Making a false report, having false uh, account sheets for where money's flowing and things like that, that would all be behind the idea of, of uh, vapor. Essentially, you're creating something where when somebody tries to come after you, they go instead after something that's not real, not tangible, not there, and will naturally waste their time. This does correlate to, say, other tactics in this video, but for now, we'll just focus on the idea of creating an, uh, a false something uh, to, to uh, where somebody goes after essentially a mirage, right? Having misleading travel itinerary documents, that's a well-known one, published in uh, multiple uh, movies and TV shows and whatnot. Of course, a pseudonym is a rather mundane example of this. 
where authors will publish books under assumed or false names, generally to protect themselves from a variety of different things. But it's also nowadays, it's most probably done because companies want to retain ownership over something and if the and they have ghost writers who publish under a certain name or they will have a certain published name of a book that's actually written by multiple people. So that's sort of how pseudonyms work today. It's a carryover from the old days. It is technically speaking what would be considered today as fraud, but it's not because it's uh, related to authorship and books and it is well known and I guarantee that the main reason why it's so prevalent was because in the old times people had to avoid censorship just like they do now except instead of pseudonyms now you have people who focus on say speaking their IP addresses and things like that but it really just comes down to the same thing being able to publish or to do certain things without your opponent knowing it's you so that they, they when they target you they actually t don't target uh, can't target you because they're going after they hit air basically another way that, of course that you can do this is by leaving no return address or writing a false return address on standard mail that's a well-known and old tactic when you mail things out to people you simply leave the return address blank of course whatever you put into that envelope letter whatnot could lead back to you uh, you know, DNA analysis, for instance, they have a lot of that in TV shows and movies, although how accurate that crap actually, you know, that people in the court system just make things up. But, um, you know, uh, everything that you do could give you away as to where you are so you could be targeted. And so with that understanding, you in instead create a facade or, or a a false copy over somewhere else well not necessarily copy but something false somewhere else that they'll go after instead uh, it's essentially it's a, like an entity that's designed to distract but also draw their attention away a red herring if you will uh, which will waste their time and of course that's not the only way that this idea of turning uh, something into vapor or the using the tactic of vapor to make people go after something that they will never uh, ultimately uh, hold or touch, right? Now with our next example, we're going to look at the tactic of promising things. Unfortunately, most of the time today, this is used continuously through for only evil purposes. It's used by the con artists that control our current system today. And this involves continuously promising things that will never be delivered on, usually. But they have to be things promised which are essentially impossible to say no to, right? And individuals who have a false, who have a bad reputation, a bad character, if they're known to be liars, they're which usually refers to people who do not follow through on their promises. They don't do things in good faith and nobody can trust their word. That relates to promises. Most people who are like that will always assume everybody else is lying because they only ever lie when they promise things they don't deliver on and so that gets reflected on everyone else. That's what they believe. So. It's important to understand that in the context of, say, you go to work, right? And you can't make it one day. You have a legitimate excuse. And then your boss will assume that you're lying. That's because your boss is probably a liar. And you see it very often where bosses continuously promise things to employees nowadays because they're trained to do that. They're only hired to that position because there's certain qualifications that are listed out in the university system as being important. And then that boss will, of course, lie, and then ultimately nobody trusts their word, right? Like, if you do this, then you get a raise. And then at the end of the year, you don't get a raise, you don't get a bonus, you don't get any of that. So clearly the guy lied. And then the next year, same thing. But nobody believes it. It doesn't work anymore as a tactic, etc. Of course, nowadays, we have this tactic of promising being used expansively across the board 
Now, most people would point to, say, politicians who continuously promise things they never deliver on. Of course, on the other hand, we have our so-called currency that we use today are essentially promissory notes. A promissory note is a debt instrument, but it's a very weird debt instrument. Instead of you going and taking out a loan and saying, I'm going to pay back, you get delivered promissory notes, which essentially would be, say, the bank has a certain quantity of something and they give you a note promising you that they have that quantity of something and they'll give it to you if you come back in with that promissory note called up. Of course, there's no way that we could take, you know, the money that we have and then go into, say, a bank and say, I want my portion of what this, quote unquote, legal tender relates to because they won't have it because that requirement has been removed, right? No reserve requirement on banks. So not only do we have promissory notes, but they're really not promise. They're, they're promising stuff to us, but we can't call them up on it. You know, that's the way they say it. So like a bank, you put, you deposit silver at a bank. This is the way to look at it. And then that bank issues a promissory note. And then you go back later and say, I want to call up this promissory note and I want my silver. And they say, we can't give it to you. You know, you're not allowed to do that. That's what we're living in today. We just have to continue based off of faith of liars that their promissory notes hold weight. And of course, we all know that they don't because the currency is worthless and it's getting more worthless every day. That's because they're liars. So that's hypothecation. That's when you publish a bunch of promissory notes off of a false pretense, right? That's a bad word. Banks today are not known to be trustworthy. There are, virtually speaking, no trustworthy banks today, because if they were, then they wouldn't be banks. They would be some sort of illegal black market enterprise, as according to the con uh, illegitimate bad character controllers that we have today, who also equally promise things they never deliver on. And naturally, when you have somebody who's good to their word and does deliver on their promises, they always want to attack and remove that individual because it shows them to be who they really are. Well, it doesn't just show them to be who they really are. If if there's somebody who falls on their word, people follow that person, not the individuals who are known to be liars. And the individuals who are known to be liars want to control everything, so they have to, of course, remove anyone who is good to their word. And any examples of that type of thing. So, so this, this idea of promising things and in a bad way, can really be found in the Bible, where, say, the so-called serpent, allegedly, who, who knows what, how that's been distorted. But either way, you know, promising the kingdom of heaven, that which wasn't his to give. You know, in most churches, as far as my experience goes, they like to present it as though, quote-unquote, the serpent, or Satan, had the capabilities of giving over this kingdom of heaven, but, of course, it didn't. Because it's just, yeah, you know. So rather than using the Bible, because that's very difficult and, and highly revised, we'll look at the Treaty of Tordesillas. And the Treaty of Tordesillas was signed by the Pope, giving one half of the world to Spain and the other half of the world to Portugal. Right? Which would have been perfectly fine if he, it was his to give the world to them, which it wasn't, and still isn't, despite the claims made by the Vatican. As most would agree. So that's an example of the promise where it's used in an evil way, but not necessarily that it's not going to be delivered on, but the fact that you're promising something that doesn't actually belong to you. You know, you get somebody who comes along and you promise them your neighbor's vehicle, right? It's sure, you might go steal that vehicle and deliver it to them, but it wasn't yours to give in the first place because it's not yours, right? So that's sort of the idea there. Now, you could use the promise for good, especially if you intentionally promise someone to something and then you actually del deliver on it in order to make your word substantial. Of course, the the give and take with this, and also the uh, essentially the understanding of uh, using the tactic correctly is important, because if you use it too much, and if you try to stick to your word too much, then that will leave you available for exploitation, because somebody will say, oh, this person cares more about the appearance of his word, so I'll just get him to promise all this nonsense, and he'll do whatever he can to follow through on it, whether or not it's detrimental to him and beneficial to them, and thus they can make you a uh, 
that you could be compromised, as it were, based off of your desire to keep promises. So it's not just the keeping of promise that's important. It's also what is being promised. So you have to be careful with your promises that you do. And also, what are the consequences of not following through on that? Consequences of not following through on, say, going to some, promising to go to somebody's uh, reunion or some sort of um, family vacation or like a party, right? Not that big. Not a big consequence if you just say, I can't go to the neighbor's party over there, right? Of course, on the other hand, it's a big consequence. If you do not follow through on your promise of allegiance to the Constitution when you enlist in the armed forces or commission in the armed forces, because that can carry the death penalty for treason, dereliction of duty, or whatnot, things like that. Although, Technically speaking, that's operated in the UCMJ or the Uniform Code of Military Justice, which is itself a usurpation of the legitimate law and the Constitution. So there's that. But some promises have more weight to them than others. Now, the next tactic that we will cover briefly uh, is pretty well known, I would say, most to most people, and that is the tactic of the gift. Now, gifts can be used for evil or good, as is well known. A gift that is the best is, of course, one that's well thought out. If you get something exactly what they wanted at Christmas, it's going to be a lot different than if you get something that they wouldn't want but can use, right? The natural comparison of a child that wants a particular toy instead gets stocks, right? He can use socks, but he's not going to be very happy about that type of gift. Now, a gift that is a, a specific need that was anticipated by somebody unsolicited will endear them to you, right? Like, uh, a lot would probably think about money today, especially considering certain circumstances. But instead of that, think about the fact that somebody's car breaks down, right? And they're just sitting there, uh, or they're, they have a flat tire. Then you come along and just give them a uh, the tools to fix their tire, right? Well, they'll be indebted to you. I mean, most people will not just give somebody a jack and a tire iron. The jack's probably a lot more expensive than the tire iron. But that would be something that's sort of anomaly and out of the blue. You don't always, of course, have to use the gift for leverage. You know, you could stop and stop by at someone on the road and just give them the things they need and then go on and leave and then you never see each other again, right? That will have altruistic consequences, it just you won't necessarily benefit from it. However, the gift strategy can naturally be used for evil as well. One of the primary examples of this, of course, would be the idea of gifting stolen property to, say, a church or nonprofit. This is very common. Churches and nonprofits are used to launder stolen property, essentially. Mostly stolen property, not just money, but mostly stolen property. Because of all the protections, right? You get some thug, some local gangster who goes around and, I don't know, steals some electronics. Then, to save himself, he just goes to a certain area, like Salvation Army or whatnot, and donates it. And then that stuff goes into the system, and then somebody comes and buys it, and it disappears, essentially. Of course, that is more done on a much larger scale when it comes to land, right? Somebody steals land, and then they donate it to a cause, and then that cause adopts the land, and then transfers it to this or that, and it's under this holding company, and then goes back there, and... and um, Thus, it is uh, effectively acquired, as it were. There's uh, quite a great deal of other examples of this gift tactic being used in some mischievous way. But it is the motive that counts. You can use the gift tactic in a mischievous way if your motive is good. And it usually comes down to the idea of self-gain, the idea of gaining control over another person. On the other hand, if that person is an enemy, an opponent, and a bad per individual, gaining control over them is not necessarily a bad thing, right? 
you can give them a gift, say, that has, like with the spy game, right? A spy might give somebody a gift which has a bug in it. And so that they can listen in on the conversation. There's all kinds of ways that this can be used. It is just a tactic that is open up to interpretation, but either way, it all revolves around the idea of gift giving. Now, this next tactic is usually only viewed as an evil one, but it isn't inherently evil, just like all these tactics. It's all about the motive of the individual, and you can use different examples to uh, determine motive or examples of motive, but every situation is different. Every situation depends, right? You could use something that on its face seems like you're using it for evil, but you actually have a good motive behind it. So it all depends, such as the protection of others. Of course, you could be protecting people, so, you know, you just never know. Well, I guess you don't never know, but uh, it does require some discernment to understand whether or not this tactic is actually being used for evil or not. And that is, of course, the idea of causing discord or to make somebody uh, outside of accord. Accord being an agreement of being uh, joined or whatnot. And the idea behind this tactic is that you would, say, ask a question that has no answer, might cause uh, conflict over sp certain fears, hatred, desires, or doubts, right? If you have individuals who are uh, antagonized to one another over something, you can fan the flames of that, basically. Or if it's a old grudge that has been sort of forgotten, you bring it back to the surface. Now, this would be used in a positive way, say, if you're dealing with two companies. And in those two companies, they're engaging in scams, right? They're scamming people and stealing their money. Now, if you're going to use this tactic in a good way, you find out whether or not individuals in the company have rivalries, which is usually the case. Usually somebody has bad blood and they went to the next company, a lateral move as it were. Of course, they're not going to go around and say that they're all scammers, right? That's not going to work. They're not going to out the other guy because the other guy will out them. But they might go after each other within their own circles. And if that feud has sort of boiled over, then you just bring it back to the surface by a little bit of instigated mischief, and thus you're causing discord and bringing down or essentially distracting the operational mechanism within inside scam companies, right? The giant companies that go around and uh, steal people's money, especially from older people who um, are taken for fools by misleading and, uh, well, you know, we all fall prey to scams constantly. Some are more obvious than others, and it uh, depends on the perspective of the individual, whether it's more obvious or not. Either way, that's an example of how you can use a particularly nasty approach with Discord and uh, essentially with a good motive. Now, a bad motive for the use of Discord, I think we don't really need. Uh, uh, many of us can come up with uh, all sorts of examples of this. A really good example, of course, is the injection of uh, robots and social media to instigate conflict conflict, or the um, people who embed with certain groups designed to cause, um, to cause disorder among that group to split it up, especially those groups that threaten the apparent ruling structure of today, right? You get a homeschool movement and you get people that embed into that, usually federal agents or whatnot, and they go around spreading rumors causing disorder. You have a church that gets broken apart because groups in the church start spreading rumors about affairs that might or might not have happened, which leads to doubt, distrust. That's an evil way to use discord. A more mundane example of how discord can be used for positive is if two people are going to engage in a fight outside of a bar because they're drunk. Somebody comes along and say, interjects by asking a question, drawing attention to a false fear that then distracts people from whatever's going on there, whatever the problem is, and turns their attention to something else. And done right, you'll be able to dispel the conflict without any, um, any true damage. That's essentially using the idea of discord, but 
in a positive way and uh and in fact a way to counteract other discord right so it's very interesting you can use the tactic of discord to counteract other tactics discord somebody comes along and tries to start a fight they start spreading rumors you can counteract that by spreading your own right you can counteract that by sp spreading rumor that say doesn't have any particularly damaging consequences to anyone but is good enough that it completely uh, takes the rug out from the original so if you're in the school right if you're a child in the school system and you can't get out of it <laughs> then you probably have to deal with the rumor mill and if you're a new student well you could go in and um and you could be targeted by a rumor of what you might have done at your old school whether or not it's true is, is irrelevant if you know what the rumor is say you were rumored that you're kicked out for i don't know selling drugs or fighting or or that your parents went to prison, I don't know. The kids come up with stupid stuff, usually because of the teachers, though. Yeah, they're usually following the example of the teachers. Well, you could counteract that by spreading your own rumor that might be innocent enough and easily to, easier to control, but it will need to be of a nature that it completely distracts away from the original rumor, which may or may not be true, such as you pee, you pee in the pool. Right. Let that slip somewhere and that will spread like wildfire and will uh, take away any of the other stuff. And it's rather mundane, right? You know, not a huge deal. Of course, you might not live that one down for a while, but it might be better than whatever original rumor that was being spread. And naturally, with children, uh, things of uh, toilet humor, as it were, generally take off faster than other things. So every... There's different complicated, complex levels. There's different contexts to this tactic. Different ways it could be used. It could be seen in mundane areas and it can be seen in very catastrophic, much more broad reaching areas. But either way, it's just like all these other tactics. It can be used for evil or good. This next tactic is a very strange one. Hence the name, the weird way. Most of us are taught the mental uh, imprisonment of duality this way or that way you have to choose one or the other and then that's the way you take it's either left or right democrats versus republicans or it's this or that you know uh, it's one or the other now on the other hand when you have more than one choice in certain contexts it still might lead back to the same result if you choose to go say with a different party in our rigged election system then it's really no no choice at all you're just going back to the same thing you know capitalism versus communism capitalism being a head structure communism also is a head structure so you choose one or the other you're still going to get one or the other you choose a different approach, it still goes back to the same way, such as if you go with a monarchy instead of capitalism or communism, it's still capitalism because you have a head, a monarch, right? So that's those are some examples of how the, the weird way, what the weird way isn't, you know. The weird way, naturally, would be something that is unknown, something that is unseen. It is the, we can call it the unknown tactic. Right. It's choosing that not to look at something and say it's either A or B, it's either this or that, or any selective amount of choices that are given, there still could be others. And it's all about continuously exploring what other choices are out there. Now, I can't right now think of any examples of this, but that's inherent in the weird way is that everything is going to be different. There's always a different way to do something. You know, you could use violence for this or that, or you could not use violence for this or that, and that's your duality. So what is a, another way, you see, instead of saying what's an alternative to violence, what's an alternative that might use violence, right? 
there's all kinds of ways to phrase things to to get out of the trap of a selective number of options to understand that there's always more things that can be done there's always more options and then out of those options select perhaps the most applicable that one can find that's the weird way it's not going with what you're taught not going with what you're told and not necessarily going with what you even know it's just going and doing something different that is a tactic of taking the weird way our next tactic is that of the labyrinth and the as the name suggests this comes down to entrapping somebody in an endless uh, rabbit hole as it were of n a never-ending um, maze right most of us today are trapped in labyrinths and our walls are generally speaking made out of paperwork right Everywhere you have paperwork, Social Security Administration, filling out forms and fees, you know, you go to a doctor's office and you have pages and pages and pages of forms to fill out. That's the labyrinth. That is designed in opposition to anyone, right? If you go into a place and they present you with a book that you have to go through and, and, and read all the fine print on, they're treating you like an enemy. And they're using the tactic of the labyrinth. This tactic can be reversed, however. Now, rather than the ridiculous idea of going in with your own document that they have to fill out, you can instead go in with your own document uh, of a uh, package, right? Something that they're required to read through. And that's sort of flipping it on its head. They probably won't read through it, and they'll probably throw it in the trash. So that might not be the most applicable strategy. It all depends on the circumstance. But either way, there are ways the labyrinth can be used for good and ways that it can be used for evil. Most of the time, and most of the examples that we see today, are used for evil. They're used for enslavement and control, and to essentially beat someone down with arbitrary mechanisms that will tire them out and waste all their energy. And, you know, the usual example would probably be of a lab rat. A lab rat is stuck inside of a maze and made to do various different things so that the person studying them can benefit, but the rat itself doesn't really benefit from the rat maze. You know, has essentially speaking no benefit for the rat. Some might say that their benefit is that they'll be given food, but that would be the same thing as the benefit for us being in this labyrinth that we call modern society like the labyrinth of the school system would be because that we get fed no we don't get fed it's just that would be a ridiculous uh, equation saying that your benefit it's a, an equal benefit to both parties it's not and it doesn't always have to be an equal benefit to both parties it has to be understood that this tactic is a weapon that can be used against opponents for good or evil not necessarily both but sometimes things could be both at the same time that's uh simply determined by the situation and how it's being used and for what purpose so there there's many examples uh but i think that uh we've covered this tactic in a sufficient manner for it to be understood. Our next tactic is that of the mimic. And mimicry is particularly well known, especially in the circles of identity theft. Now you can mimic somebody, but not to enough of a, uh, of a exact copy that it becomes easily to easy to distinguish. On the other hand, if you remove the original, then the fraud becomes the only one and thus has to be taken. Unless, of course, you know, there's those that know of the original and say that's not the original. So that's always going to be an issue. We see that very often today with the theft of Facebook profiles, uh, financial identities and whatnot. And there's a lot of 
individuals that are trained to detect the tactic of the mimic. However, this can be used in a variety of different ways. For instance, if, say, you don't have the money to hire attorneys, but I would more come from the perspective of attorneys are dishonest. Any that are licensed uh, work in that system to support the system, and they're evil. They are enemies of the people. In that case, you take the uh, job into your own hands of becoming your own attorney. And rather than reading through all of the endless amount of case histories, case laws, so-called case laws at least, which are decisions in their phony system, or the code, statutes, whatnot, instead of looking at that, instead you read documents that are published by attorneys. And then you just replicate the structure, organization, and speech pattern of those documents. Then anyone that you send a document to which replicates that they're going, especially if they're trained attorneys, they're going to think it's coming from another trained attorney. And all you're doing is just mimicking the style of the trained attorney. You can find this tactic anywhere. Somebody who mimics the style of a, a pilot, for instance, somebody who mimics a police officer, will likely be able to pass themselves off legitimately. You know, you have people that joyride around giving fake tickets, and if they're good enough, and nobody knows the difference. I think they're real cop. Now, it's much harder to do this when you're talking about ingrained habits, like with the culture of the military, especially the Marine Corps. It's much easier for a Marine to detect another false Marine than it is for, say, anyone else to detect a false Marine. And that has to do with the culture and ingrained habits, the recognition of patterns. So certain things are a lot easier to mimic than others, but either way, this tactic of the mimic can be very useful and can be uh, applicable to more areas than just uh, physical pretense. It could be done in paperwork and writing and all sorts of other ways. Now, our last tactic essentially comes from or, or is, has to do with all the other tactics as well. And that has to do with the idea of multiplication. Rather than doing one singular thing, as many would know, instead of, say, punching the same um, once, right? Nobody goes into a fight and punches their opponent once. That might happen occasionally. But generally, if you're in a fight, you're probably going to throw more than one blow. That's the idea of multiplication. You want to do the tactic more than once. Because if you only do it once, then it's probably not going to have much of an impact. But if you do it over and over again, then you're multiplying it. So as an example, is if you're trying to create an adverse variable by sending out a letter, you don't send just one letter. You send out hundreds of letters to different people. That's multiplication of the tactic. Now, on the other hand, you can multiply multiple tactics and combine them together as well. So that's not just doing one tactic, but doing many different tactics at the same time per se, or the same purpose and the same objective. You don't just send letters out to create a adverse variable. You publish things online, you go and talk to people, you go join groups and you actively try and uh, achieve the objective through many different means. So that's very important is that not only do we see each individual tactic itself as something that can be useful, but we see all of the tactics as can be joined together to form a singular tactic under this idea of multiplication, which essentially speaking, when you multiply it, you also combine it. So you have both going on multiplication and combination at the same time.